Shalom and welcome to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker. Mount Sinai is the very place where God's presence was revealed in a blazing fire, according to Hebrews 12 and 18. This is the mountain where Elijah fled to and heard the still, small voice of God from 1 Kings 19. It's also likely the place where Paul the Apostle traveled to shortly after his conversion experience to receive a fuller revelation of his gospel from heaven. It's a mountain that's literally drenched with divine history. So where is Mount Sinai? The debate over where the true Mount Sinai is located goes back thousands of years. Since the popularization of the view that Jebel al in Saudi Arabia is the real location by American explorers Ron Wyatt, Bob Cornicky, and Jim and Penny Paul Caldwell, the debate has only raged all the more. Now joining us is New York Times best-selling author and internationally recognized teacher Joel Richardson as he explores the many reasons why the controversial location is by far the best candidate for the true mountain of God. Joel is a New York Times best-selling author, filmmaker, and teacher, lives in the United States with his wife and five children. With a special love for all the peoples of the Middle East, Joel travels globally preparing the church for the great challenges of our time teaching on the gospel, living with biblical hope, and the return of Jesus. He's the author, editor, director, or producer of several books and documentaries and is the host of the popular online Christian program, The Underground. You can find more about Joel at joelstrumpet.com. Here to discuss his breakthrough new book, Mount Sinai in Arabia, is Joel Richardson. Joel, welcome back to Revealing the Truth. Eric, it's very good to be back with you. It's great to see you, my friend. This has been a chronicle of a journey of a lifetime. I think that uh, as I look at the various things you've done over the time that I've known about you and the years that I've known you, uh, this probably, uh, I think, would chronicle one of your great uh, top five escapades, uh, journeys, into looking for and finding uh, what you believe is to be the location of the not mythical but biblical location of Mount Sinai. What was it like for you in the preparation? How excited were you as you planned this trip and this exploration? Uh, what was going on inside of you? Because I know that there was almost a, what I would call the Joel Richardson quiet period. And I knew that Joel, during, during the Joel Richardson quiet period, something really major was going on. You shared with me nine months ago uh, that you had something really miraculous going on and that you would probably not drop off the radar, but you and I would reconnect after the first of the year because there was a lot that was going to happen and it was going to happen quickly. And now here we are with the release of the book, Mount Sinai in Arabia, and it's stunning and it's complete. And I wanted to get your emotional, your spiritual, I wanted to capture what it was that was lit and ignited and how that worked out in your life. Yeah, no, that's, that's, it's been a, it's been an amazing year and a half. Um, so I tell the story where it was really, it was toward the end of 2017 and, um, I had a friend text me and he said, Hey, a friend of mine was just at this location in Saudi Arabia, um, that he believes is the real Mount Sinai. Now I had seen some of the videos and pictures just a little bit over the years. You know, again, I'd heard the stories of how Ron Wyatt had gone there back in the early eighties, uh, later Bob Cornuke had gone and there's a handful of others. And then, of course, Jim and Penny Caldwell were the ones who went and took all of the pictures and videos um, that were later used by Ron Wyatt as well as um, Bob Cornuke and so forth. And, you know, I'm, I'm busy. You know, I'm writing and all of these things. I don't have time to explore um, every sort of interesting thing that falls across my desk. You know, I get uh, four or five books, you know, uh, sometimes a week. And people are saying, can you read this? And I said, I would love to. I just, I can't clone myself. So this thing caught my attention. Uh, the reason I say it is it unusual, in an unusual way, it caught my attention, but I was still cautious. And I prayed and I said, Lord, you know, I would love the opportunity to get in there someday. 
And so that sort of forms the backdrop. You know, it was a very unusual prayer. Archaeology, this sort of thing, this is not really my thing. You know, I'm a missions guy. I'm talking about the return of Jesus, uh, how these things all relate. And so this thing fell on my lap. All of a sudden, a friend says, hey, you know, a mutual friend was just here. And I said, well, can he get me in? Because this is the issue with Saudi Arabia is, you know, I would love to go see it, but I'm not going to sneak into the country illegally or anything like that. And so because of my uh, my history with film and photography, he said, well, he can have you come and just do you know some some work for a company, do some promotional photography work. Um, and so that's what's needed is a letter of invitation. So I got it. Well, that said, as soon as we agreed to this, I could feel the spiritual warfare. And I mean, thick, heavy, heavy spiritual warfare. And I'm not someone who is normally very sensitive to this. And to me, this was an indicator that this was significant. I mean, I could just, in the spirit, I could sense that this was something very significant. And there was a lot of resistance along the way. I won't get into all the details there. Um, but so as I finally got there, it was a few months later before we initially planned. By the time that we got there, it was the end of April, beginning of May. And um, by the time that we got there, I'll say it was a combination of seeing the mountain for the first time. Now, of course, I've been really doing a lot of heavy research leading up to this now. So now I'm a lot more familiar with it than I had been initially. So there was a mixture of tremendous awe with unbelievable spiritual warfare, just emotional, spiritual issues weighing on me um, as the enemy had sort of just released hell along the way. Some of it even unfolding minutes before we got to the mountain. Um, just, you know, I'm getting phone calls. I'm in the airport now boarding, now boarding. And I'm, I'm dealing with just crisis of things that are unfolding. And so it was an incredible mixture of emotions as I'm walking around, looking at this mountain with one of the most awe-inspiring, faith-building, just stunning sort of experiences of my life. And you can feel, you know, again, I, I don't mean to get overly woo-woo, but uh, it's like you can feel the echoes of the events that took place there. It's like when you are there, you can just tell that this is the place. And I know that's subjective. This is not, uh, you know, to say I could feel something that's not biblical exegesis. But I could feel that. And it was mixed with the spiritual warfare. So it was a, it was a tremendously um, powerful time in a lot of different ways. But um, and I'm still feeling the, the reverberations of that. You know, it, it's it's lit a fire in me that uh, I don't think is ever going to go out. You know, you are well known for your Mystery Babylon, for the uh, Islamic Antichrist. There's a lot of people that turn to you and follow you for prophetic insight. And here we come to Saudi Arabia, which plays a very important part biblically in many different scenarios. One of the most obvious, of course, is their uh, contra position to the Gog Magog. They are notably ones that do not support it. They argue against it. They take a firm stand against it. So Saudi Arabia, in regards to Israel, is perceived in biblical terms as a friend. Even though this is the core of Mecca, it is the heart of Islam, it's the largest gathering, uh, uh, the uh, Hajj of any uh, Muslim gathering in the world, but yet um, almost antithetically, they're not in support of the destruction of Israel. They don't play a part in this gathering that's going to come against and bring about the uprising of the Antichrist and the armies of the Antichrist. So Saudi Arabia is an interesting place because it's a dichotomy. And in uh, just recent news, Saudi Arabia is taking on a more liberal approach to Islam, giving women the rights to drive, uh, not requiring uh, the hajib, some, some real modernization which is sending a lot of ripples into the Islamic world as to who is and what is Saudi Arabia and what is happening there, let alone this being the place where you have discovered, based on this expedition, the location uh, and you provide the evidence for this being the location of the biblical Mount Sinai. 
So knowing all that and digesting all that, what were your thoughts about when you went there, if you actually did discover, what was your plan to do with this? Because I know you have this book that you've released. Uh, there are many pictures in it. Uh, many photographs, many diagrams, much, much evidence about all this. But take us back to the genesis of the significance of Mount Sinai and the initial crossing of Moses uh, of the Red Sea. Uh, I happen to be uh, best friends with Ido Kanan, who is one of the uh, archaeologists who discovered one of three possible crossings of the Red Sea, there's three where they found, have found chariot wheels, they found various artifacts. He was the discoverer and credited with, as the discoverer of one of them. So we've talked about this before and we talked about the journey and where the journey would take the Israelites as they left Egypt. And your uh, depiction of this takes us to a location different than what others have found. So where was the did the research take you, and what was it that brought you to this particular spot? Okay, so a few questions there. Let me uh, let me actually start with uh, one statement. You said, you know, discovered Mount Sinai. Um, obviously, I didn't discover it. Um, I was just, uh, I visited uh, this location that right. had been, you know, and, and, and within this discussion, too, let me just say this. Um, it's interesting because I found that if I post any video or comment about Mount Sinai, you'll get different people that are part of different camps. You have some people that are devout um, supporters of Ron Wyatt. And it's very, very important that they say, Ron discovered this, Ron found all these things. Now, um, Ron was the first Western modern explorer to bring this back to light. Um, but I don't even like to say that he discovered it because the fact is it was never lost. Right. The local Bedouins have always believed that this is the real Mount Sinai. If you go there and ask them, they all know it. Um, you can find examples um, in, uh, there's a, a friend of mine, uh, Ryan Morrow, who just put out a video recently. He also visited the mountain over the, a couple times over the past few years. And he has a video in there that was filmed by Bob Cornuk of a very elderly um, uh, gentleman who was in the Air Force back in World War II. And he was working there in Saudi Arabia, and he flew over the mountain. And the Saudis at that time, I mean, here we are back in the 40s, they said, that's Mount Sinai. And, uh, and he, he cries as he re retells this story. You know, here he is in his 90s, and he says, the Lord let me fly over that mountain. I knew that that was it. I looked down, and they said, that's it, and I knew that was it. And I was, I was scared to fly over it, but, you know, he did. So the point is this is. It wasn't ever completely lost, but it was largely forgotten. So you have folks like Ron Wyatt, who he was the first. We have to give him credit. He was the first to rediscover it, to, to, to popularize it back here in, in the West. Um, Bob Cornuk did go and visit. And then, of course, the Caldwells explored it and this sort of thing. But everybody deserves credit for the different parts in all of this. But the point is, it's not about Ron Wyatt. It's not about Bob Cornuk. It's not about me. It's not about anyone. It's about the mountain. It's about God's testimony. This is about the Lord. It's not about any one man. So that's very important just because there's a lot of this weird, I, I just stepped into this unaware and I, I found all of this weird tension between the different camps. You know, this group loves Bob Cornuke, this group loves Ron Wyatt. And I say, guys, you know, this is just sort of uh, Paul all over again. You know, one man is for Apollo, another one is for Paul, another one says I'm for Christ. This has to be about the Lord and his testimony. Okay, so that said, now let's talk about the prophetic significance of this coming to light at this time, to, to be open to the world at this moment in history. All of a sudden, out of the blue, Saudi Arabia, which is often perceived to be one of the most radical, uh, reclusive, closed Islamic nations, certainly uh, among the Sunni Islamic nations in the world, and and that's understandable. Again, it's hard to get into the country. You can't even enter Mecca um, or the sort of inner sanctions, sanctums of uh, Medina unless you are Muslim, this sort of thing. Um, however, all of a sudden, out of the blue, Mohammed bin Salman, this young reformer, emerges. And he starts talking about letting women go to movie theaters and driving and all, and all of this modernization. 
you could use the word liberalization, but let's just say modernization. Essentially, he's a very perceptive, uh, wise, in my opinion, leader. He's looking at Saudi Arabia. He's recognizing the fact that they cannot be sustained on oil alone. And of course, as this ever-expanding royal family continues to grow, we've got, I believe now, over 30,000 princes you know, related to the original founding uh, king of Saudi Arabia. Um, they can't just sort of give out these financial stipends to everybody. You know, it's a tremendous wealth, welfare state, if you will. So recognizing that they need to modernize their economy, um, the, the easing up of some of the hyper-religious restrictions is part of this larger project to modernize the economy. And so right at the heart of this larger project called Saudi 2030, Saudi Vision 2030, is his plan to build this mega city called Neom. And it's right up there. I mean, just put this in, in perspective, the city that he wants to build encompasses an area that is approximately the same size as the entire state of Israel. You look at a map, it's basically, you could fit the whole state of Israel into this, what's gonna be a city. This is gonna be Dubai on steroids um, times 10. You know, this is sort of his plan. now. It just so happens, and I believe this is within the sovereignty of God. This is no coincidence that right in the heart of this city is the real Mount Sinai. And so one of the reasons I believe, one of the prophetic reasons I believe this is the case is because the Lord has preserved and protected this mountain all along. He's, he's allowed it to sort of be hidden. He allowed Ron Wyatt to be the first one that brought it to light, but yet he, he let it remain for 30 years behind the the iron curtain if you will of of the kingdom of saudi arabia well now it's opening up because uh, muhammad bin salman wants to let in the world into neom because he wants this international city of commerce and technology and science and all of these things and he actually says the laws in neom will be different than the rest of the country it will be very much a, an international um you know, city with, with very modern laws and this sort of thing. So how is it that the Lord has arranged that this thing would be opened up to the world at this time, in this moment of tremendous unbelief throughout the world, at a moment when unbelief, intellectual atheism and agnosticism and a rejection of the Bible and the history of the Bible and all these things is running rampant, is exploding throughout the earth, that all of a sudden the Lord would go back to the very story of the Exodus, the very story of God coming down in blazing fire on that mountain. I mean, the biggest, most foundational, most miraculous parts of the story of redemption, of the biblical story. And he's going to say, hey, guys, guess what? It's all true. It all happened. It's right here. To do that right in this moment, I think that's profound. This is about God's testimony. It is about his testimony to the world that the same one that came down in fire with an earthquake in tr with trumpets, the blasting of trumpets, that he is coming back on the clouds with blazing fire, with a mighty earthquake, with the blasting of trumpets, and he's going to judge the living and the dead. And we will all give an account because God in heaven has appointed this man, the Messiah, Yeshua, to be the judge of the living and the dead. And so I believe the Lord is testifying to the world concerning the foundations to say all of the foundations are true. And if he was faithful to deliver his people Israel out of bondage, so also will he be faithful to return and deliver us from the oppression of, of this world, of this age. Okay, so there's that. Then there's the issue of the, the present um, alignment of the geopolitical landscape of the Middle East as it, as it relates to the geopolitical landscape described by the biblical prophets. So you alluded to Ezekiel 38, 39, Gog, Magog. Um, here you have this, this coalition from the north, from the uh, Safaun, Safaun, in the, 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 the far north, as it says in Ezekiel. Now, this is probably a topic for another time, but this is referring to Turkey. It's referring to Asia Minor and northern Syria, that whole area up there. There's actually a mountain up there that was known as Mount Safan. And it's actually in modern-day Turkey, right on the border of Syria, close to Aleppo there in the Hatay province, the very sort of Arab province of southern Turkey. And so you have this prophecy of this Turkish-led 
uh, alliance led by a dictator from that part of the world that will attempt to invade and attack Israel in the last days. You know, we can we can use the language of the Bible, the Antichrist, the man of sin, but just, you know, to someone who is not familiar with all these things, we're just talking about a Middle Eastern dictator emerging in the last days, gathering a coalition of nations and attacking Israel. What's crazy about that? There's nothing crazy about that. We've seen it multiple times. We've seen dictators emerge. This story is as old as human history. and It's been repeated a million times. Well, in the midst of this invasion of Israel, you have this protest that comes up from Sheba and Dedan. And then it says, you know, all of the, the young lions, the merchants of Tarshish and so forth. And this seems to be, biblically speaking, the names, uh, Dedan, these are the children of Ishmael. And they settled where? They settled in Saudi Arabia. So here in the context of the last days, at the time of the return of the Messiah, you have this protest coming out of the children of Ishmael, out of Saudi Arabia, against this Turkish invasion of Israel. Well, right now, you look at the, the landscape, the geopolitical landscape of the Middle East. You have this emerging dictator in Turkey. And all of this controversy over the past few months with Jamal Khashoggi, this fake journalist, who um, was killed, you know, in the Saudi embassy. Um, you know, that was obviously unfortunate. We're not endorsing that. But the point is this. Here you have Turkey leading the charge, Turkey and Qatar, of course, which is the home of Al Jazeera. And they were the ones leading the charge, attacking and going after Mohammed bin Salman. And this is coming from the nation that has jailed more journalists than any other nation in the world, more than Iran, more than China, more than probably all of them combined. And you have dozens of journalists that have died in prison, that have disappeared. And, and they're the ones protesting the murder of one individual. This is hypocrisy of the worst form, okay? So you have this conflict. You have to understand, Turkey represents the Turkish branch of Hamas. Turkey represents the, the Turkish leadership of the Muslim Brotherhood. Muslim Brotherhood represents sort of the conflicting political... Uh, branch in the Middle East that is in conflict with Saudi Arabia. So Saudi Arabia has this um, this friendship, if you will, with the United States, again, because of Aramco and the oil, the petrodollar and all of these things. And essentially what this is, is it's a couple of, it's a couple alpha dogs banging heads over who gets to be the alpha dog. Turkey's very upset. They want to be the leader of the Middle East. And they recognize that Saudi Arabia has tremendous power, friendship with the United States, and so this conflict that we see in Ezekiel 38, 39, as well as, by the way, in Daniel 11, which talks about the king of the north, which is, again, the Antichrist or Gog. It is this leader of this coalition from the north is in conflict with the king of the south, which in biblical history was Ptolemy. This was Egypt. But so really right now you have sort of this um, king of the south, uh, Erdogan, Turkey. In the south you have Assisi in uh, Egypt, and he is in alliance with who? With the Jordanians, with the Saudis, with the more moderate bloc in the south, and, um, and we are largely, you know, friends with uh, these. These are some of the best Middle Eastern leaders that we have. Again, Sisi and, um, and uh, the king in, in Jordan. Uh, I, was, I was confused, the father of the son, Hussein and Abdullah. And, um, and then, of course, now we have emerging Mohammed bin Salman. So you have sort of this king of the south block as well as the king of the north block forming. So you have the geopolitical landscape of the Middle East aligning with the picture described by the biblical prophets by both Ezekiel and Daniel. And I think that's very significant. Um, and it's all this all ties into this project of modernization. We're talking with Joel Richardson, author of the newly released book, Mount Sinai in Arabia. <clears throat> you can find more about Joel at joelstrumpet.com. We're talking about the mountain, uh, Mount Sinai, uh, as opposed to the traditional view that the Egyptian Sinai Peninsula is the home of the uh, traditional site of Mount Sinai. Joel has traveled to this mountain. He has brought back physical evidence, photography, graphs, charts, and information contained in this book that is absolutely irrefutable that this is the location. When we return from break, we're going to talk about, based on his research, where the Israelites actually did cross the Red Sea and how that journey took them to 
this location as opposed to other proposed locations and what makes him believe that this is the location, what evidence he found, and what his experience was like. We'll be right back. Not everything that makes the headlines has biblical importance, but many events that happen around the world do, and you never hear about them. Igniting a Nation is pleased to teach Revealing Prophecy every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. at the Marriott 280 in Birmingham. We will cover worldwide events and insider information that will connect the dots of what's happening around the world with biblical prophecy. If you happen to miss a class, we'll televise each week's class at 10 o'clock Central Time on ignitinganation.com and all our social media outlets. Copies of the teachings will also be available to purchase on our website at www.ignitinganation.com. The Lord meets you right where you are, and so does Igniting Nation's new live streaming outlets. You can now watch Revealing the Truth, Revealing the Bible, and Prophecy Revealed simulcast live each Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to 1 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time on YouTube Live, Facebook Live, Vimeo, Periscope, and through our website, www.ignitinganation.com. No matter what device you are using, our program will automatically scale so you won't have to miss a single program. And if you happen to miss an episode, you can always subscribe to the Igniting a Nation YouTube channel and access over 1,000 interviews and never miss your favorite authors, special guests, and topics that interest you the most. There are lots of ways to see Israel, but nothing compares to seeing the land of the book and the people of the book through the eyes of two Jewish believers who can take you on a journey that will bring the entire Bible to life. When you join Rabbi Eric Walker and his number one rated tour guide, Edo Canaan in Israel, you'll experience incredible teachings, first class accommodations, and actually walk where Jesus walked. You will experience the Bible transforming from black and white into living color, and you will never see the Bible in the same way again. For more information, visit us at www.ignitinganation.com forward slash events. The Lord contends with what contends with you, and Igniting a Nation is committed to bringing to light each and every issue that faces a believer's life. Our live stream programming and teachings take you on a journey to finding biblical truth from a wide variety of experts who share their insights into a deeper walk with the Lord. We have assembled the most comprehensive panel of experts in the fields of prophecy, caregiving, healing from trauma, shame, and abuse, and so much more. We continue to expand our teachings and programming to meet your needs. We're committed to healing the nations with biblical truth. Visit www.ignitinganation.com to develop a deeper walk with the Lord and start your journey to a transformed life. The Bible commands us to study to show ourselves approved, but most study using Bible study tools and not actually studying the Bible chapter and verse. Igniting a Nation is pleased to present Revealing the Bible, recorded and taught each week before a live audience. We take you deeper into the actual Bible and verse in both Hebrew and English and connect the dots between the Old and New Testament. You can attend our two classes in Tuscaloosa and Birmingham or watch the program every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Central Time on ignitinganation.com and all our other simulcast outlets. For more information, visit www.ignitinganation.com forward slash events. Shalom and welcome back to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, and we're talking with Joel Richardson, author of the new book uh, that just has... Said welcome back to the program. Good to be back with you, Eric. Uh, Joel, you, um, uh, before break, we talked about the uh, uh, traditional view that Mount Sinai was somewhere to be found in the Egyptian Sinai Peninsula and that the crossing of the Red Sea took them into... Uh, the Sinai Peninsula, not into Saudi Arabia, but you found evidence 
of uh, different crossing and a different n route that was taken. Uh, what evidence did you find and what led you to that, uh, uh, d that discovery and that conclusion? Yeah, well, let me just say that there's a few different possibilities in terms of the actual spot where they crossed. And I mean, this is with regard to those who believe that Mount Sinai is in Arabia, Saudi Arabia. So among those who believe the crossing took place through the Gulf of Aqaba, the Red Sea, that's south of Aqaba and Elat, as opposed to on the western side of the Sinai Peninsula, north of the Gulf of Suez. Okay, so among those that believe it actually happened through the Red Sea, there's a few different locations. Um, some have suggested down through the Straits of Tehran. Others have suggested that it's um, right at the location of Wadi Watir or uh, Nueva. I don't have a real strong opinion. I, I personally do think that it's probably Nueva because when you look at the writings of Josephus, he describes the beach of Nueva precisely. Um, Josephus says, look, you know, the Egyptians had surrounded Israel against the water, and it says they came through the, the I'm sorry, the Egyptians had surrounded the Israelites against the water in these mountains. It says the Israelites came down this very long, narrow corridor, and the mountains on both sides were very tall. Well, this describes this gorge, if you will, a wadi, this wadi, Watir that, that leads out to Nueva perfectly. And um, there's really no other options. Now, interestingly, by the way, you know, he talks about these very high mountains before they crossed. There's no mountains in these areas over by the north of Suez. So that's the tr all the traditional scholars say it's over there. It's plains. These are plains. There's no mountains. So either Josephus was completely out to lunch um, or these scholars are out to lunch. Um, and of course, Josephus was roughly uh, 2,000 years closer um, to the events than modern scholars. But um, that said, the reason that I believe it was through the Gulf of Aqaba or the Red Sea is because the Bible says so. Um, so the word used for the sea crossing is Yam Suf. Yam meaning ocean or sea. And Suf is a bit of a debatable word. What does Suf mean? Well, the reason it's sort of so confusing is because in the Septuagint, this is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, it took place beginning in the third century BC. So we're talking about 250 years or so before Jesus, um, actually about 280, well, let's just say 250 years before the birth of Jesus. And um, the, the translators of the Septuagint, they translate the word into the Greek, uh, Irapha Thalassa, um, which means Red Sea. And the reason that they translated as Red Sea, because this was the term used by the Greek as well as the Roman geographers um, for that sea that was way down there by the Indian Ocean, sort of south of the Arabian Peninsula. It was like the sea, the ocean, as opposed to the Mediterranean Sea. It was the other one way, way, way down there. So they didn't really have a name for this inlet that we call the Red Sea. They didn't know what to call it, so they just called it by the only name that they knew, the, the Erythalasso, or the um, Mauro Rubro, or Mauro Rubrum yeah, in the Latin. And so then we eventually embrace this sort of bad translation of the Red Sea. Well, now modern scholars come along and they go, oh, the Red Sea is wrong. And everyone acknowledges Red Sea because red, um, because Suf does not mean red, period. Um, so modern scholars come along and they say, well, Suf is an Egyptian loan word and it means reeds. And there's one verse in the Bible where it says that um, Moses' mother laid him in a basket among the Suf. So they say, well, that must mean reeds. But really, there's not any solid evidence for that either. In other words, that's probably a terrible translation as well. A much better translation is that Suf means the end or the boundary. So essentially, this is the sea of the boundary. Well, what does the Bible say is the boundary, the southernmost boundary of the promised land? It's actually Elat. It's the tip of the, the Red Sea, the Yam Suf. So first of all, um, there's just sort of like all of this history that a lot of people, it requires a bit of untangling for most people to understand. So first of all, there's that. Second of all, the Bible makes it clear where the Yam Suf is. You have several verses which are very, very clear, several. Um, for instance, it says in 1 Kings that King Solomon built a fleet of ships down by Ezion Geber, 
which means the backbone of the giant, um, which is kind of, that's what the mountains look like over there. If you see the mountains down by the self of Aqaba, they look like the backbone of a giant. I used to, uh, I spent several months actually in Elat back in 1994. And, um, and it says that it was by Eloth. Well, Eloth is simply the name for the modern city of Elat. So here you have, and it says, and it says it was at the Yamsuf. Okay, so the Yamsuf is associated with Elat. You have a handful of other verses which are very, very clear that all say the Yamsuf is connected to the Red Sea. Now, there's one verse in the Bible, one verse that says that the locusts covered the entire land of Egypt, and then a western wind or a sea wind, this is the wind that would have blown from the northwest, from the Mediterranean, blew the locusts, and a lot of English translations say into the Red Sea. So everyone says, well, this must be the Gulf of Suez or the marshes to the north of the Suez. Um, but the problem with that is that's not what the Hebrew says. The Hebrew says toward the Red Sea, out of the land of Egypt, toward the Red Sea. So in all likelihood, they were not blown into the Gulf of Suez. They were not blown into these marshes north of the Gulf of Suez. They were blown all the way out of the land of Egypt. And by the way, the most of the Sinai Peninsula would have been understood to have been part of Egypt. Because even the Bible says that the border of Egypt, it's used interchangeably with um, uh, Wadi, uh, what's it called? Slip in my mind right now. But it's, it's about 120 miles to the southwest of Gaza. Okay, Wadi, Wadi al-Arish. So Wadi al-Arish is the boundary between Egypt and Israel. And if you're looking at the, the Sinai Peninsula, it's about three quarters of the way um, toward the east, you know, outside of, um, in past, you know, uh, past the, uh, the the tip, if you will, of the um, Peloponnesian branch of the Nile. So, you know, way, way further east from the, um, the, the Suez. So the point is, biblical geography tells us where the sea crossing happened. It happened through the Gulf of Aqaba. So there's a lot of tradition, there's a lot of scholarship that um, has accumulated, has calcified over the years, that sort of backs up the traditional view, but the Bible makes it very clear that that tradition is false, it's wrong, it's not supportable by the biblical testimony. Well, plus there's the archaeological evidence. I know the archaeologist, the underwater archaeologist that has found chariot wheels and in the Red Sea who did the exploration of one of three potentially identified crossing points which was in the Red Sea. Uh, I happened to be making a trip there with him in uh, March of 2020. It'll be my first trip to Petra, and we're gonna spend two days in a lot, and one of those days will be spent on the Red Sea so that we can do some exploration together with a group, of course, of 50 that travel with me. But it's important that I wanna see this firsthand and uh, really be able to lay my eyes on this clearest, what people don't understand, the Red Sea is the clearest body of water on Earth. Uh, it has a visibility unaided, I believe, of 100 yards. That's how clear it is, which means that uh, the archaeological digs that are being done <clears throat> are facilitated by God created this very clear body of water uh, for them to be able to find and locate various artifacts. So. Uh, there's a great deal of evidence that says that it is the Red Sea, both modern-day archaeology and biblical archaeology. Uh, why do you think that, um, uh, and, and it's not that this mountain was hidden, but why do you think that today this is so significant, so significant that my friend Joel Richardson, who... Uh, in the years that I've known you, has never invested an idle moment in his biblical scholarship. Uh, you're very selective. You're, you're one of the people that I know that is not easily distracted uh, by this or by this, uh, by this new thought or this new thought. Uh, you're disciplined, you're focused, you are fluent. Uh, you have a deep abiding calling for the Muslim people for the gospel advancing in places where others don't reach. Uh, this program alone reaches 120 
uh, home churches in Pakistan that we correspond with that call me Papa. Uh, we too are very much involved in getting this through our medium into the homes of the Muslim families that are only getting what their wazir is telling them they're only getting and the only thing they have is a phone and that phone happens to be connected to the internet and they can get this program and this is why we do this. We share the same burden of the great commission versus what the world embraces the great omission and they preach to everybody but the Muslims and the Jews. Uh, you and I share that burden for the Middle East and for the Muslim nations and for the Jewish people and our hearts are bound together that way. So here you took many months and a great deal of your own personal time to devote to this exploration. Um, why do you think now is the time? Because this is a today revelation. This is a today release. You could have released a book about Mount Sinai 10 years ago based on just the amount of research that you had and come up with any kind of speculatory and linkage and biblical linkage and come out with a book on prophecy about Saudi Arabia. But why today and then why the follow-on book, which will be the prophetic link between this uh, pilgrimage, if you will, this archaeological uh, expedition that you took? Let me just give you a, an anecdote. I was um, sitting on the plane after I had just left the mountain. We uh, had gone through Amsterdam. And I was sitting next to a guy. It became real apparent after about three words that this was a, uh, a Jew from New York. You know, he had a new, you know, I'm originally East Coast, so I picked up on the accent right away. And uh, he, he asked me, he said, where are you coming from? Uh, he, for some reason, assumed that I had just come through Switzerland and he was just making conversation. And I said, well, interestingly, I, I'm just coming from Saudi Arabia. He says, well, what in the world were you doing there? And I said, well, believe it or not, I said, I think I was just at the real Mount Sinai. And uh, he immediately said, oh, come on, you know, all that stuff's not true, right? And I said, well, what do you mean it's not true? And uh, I started showing him pictures <laughs> and um, he says, oh, that's, you know, I'm sure you believe that. But he says, long ago, German higher critical scholarship has completely disproved the Exodus. No one believes it anymore. The truth is, Eric, if you were to go to a conference of Exodus scholars today, even Christian Exodus scholars, there's a pretty large percentage that don't believe the Exodus ever happened. Why? Because there's a tremendous lack of evidence because they're looking in all the wrong places. Arguably, you could even say they're looking at the wrong time frame. But the point is this, they don't believe it because there's a lack of evidence. Well, I believe that there's a reason that the Lord is allowing it to be revealed now and in the location where it is. I believe that the Lord, look, let me just back up. When you look at the Passover, this is the single most continuously celebrated uh, holiday in human history. Over 3,500 years, this has been celebrated year after year after year, someplace in the world. And what is the Passover all about? Remember, 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 remember. God says, you will do this so that you will pass it on to your children, so that you will tell everyone about the mighty things that I did when I led you out of bondage with a mighty and outstretched hand, how I came down on the mountain in power. All the remember, remember, remember. All of Torah, all of the, everything, it's about remembering. And by and large, the scholarly community, they have forgotten. The Jewish community, many of them have forgotten. The Islamic world, ironically, tend to be those that believe it almost better than many others in much of the Christian world. They go, well, you know, and so this Jewish guy, he says, oh, these are just lessons. I mean, they're more, I said, do you go to synagogue? He goes, oh yeah, yeah, but I don't, nobody believes all those, they're myths. And I said, what are we talking about here? I said, I'm the Gentile, you're the Jew. You're supposed to be convincing me of these things. And I'm looking at Deuteronomy 32 unfolding right in front of me through the lips of a foolish non-people. I will rebuke you, I'll provoke you to jealousy because you have been unfaithful to me. God goes, so here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna use a bunch of dumb Gentiles to, to rebuke you concerning your unfaithfulness and unbelief. But I believe the Lord has it here and now because he is about to personally testify to the world, remember, remember this, remember, remember, remember. Remember when I came down in fire, remember when I ripped the ocean in half, the craziest, most overt miracles in all of the Bible. 
and he is going to remind the world because God himself has a testimony. If we are unfaithful, the rocks themselves will cry out. And I believe that he's testifying because I do believe that we are approaching that time of the return of the Messiah and things are gearing up. And so even in, in the heavenlies, God himself is gearing up and is preparing for the events that I think we'll see over the next 10, uh, 20 years. You know, if the description of what happened on Mount Sinai uh, does not parallel the same description as given in Acts chapter 2, which are identical descriptions. The giving of the law and the giving of the Spirit are identical. There was the shofar blast. There was the earthquake. There was the, sh the, the tongues of fire. There was the smoke. So much so, the people were afraid that this was striking terror in the people. The descriptions are identical in the description of the uh, encounter with Moses and the giving of the law and the encounter in the upper room and the giving of the Spirit. It is the exact same description of a parallel event that was described to us in Jeremiah 31 that would tell us that I'm going to give you a new covenant and this was the way it was given not written on top of tablets of stone, but written in your minds and in your heart, and the same setting, in the same upper place. It had to be, all of this was, was, so if you believe in the New Testament, you have to believe in the Exodus, you have to believe in the giving of the Ten Commandments, you have to believe in Mount Sinai because the description is identical. There's not one jot or tittle that's different in the setting in the upper room, and people miss that parallel. They miss the parallel as to why the people were gathered there for Shavuot, for Feast of Weeks, for Pentecost. They missed all of that, and all of this links that together. And I agree with you that the time for revelation is now in preparation for an event to come. And so the building of this city, uh, Nome, on, on uh, um, Mount Sinai, the drawing of, a, of the world's attention to this place is a precursor. Now, you and I both believe uh, that, that we are on the verge of a period of time where things are aligning. We're not date setters, but we do see that within the next maybe 15, 20 years, that things are aligning in such a way that probably if we took the, the Hillel calendar and we put back the missing 200 years, we'd be right around the 6K uh, year on the Jewish calendar, which I'm a Y6Ker. Uh, I've shared that with you before. I believe that the thousand years is the equivalent of the Sabbath in the story of creation, the seventh day. So at the end of 6,000 years, we're in 5779. There's missing years in Hillel's calendar. Uh, if we put them back, we're 20, 25 years. And I see that as being a very plausible time for these alignments for Ankara, which is due north of Jerusalem. We have to look at the Bible through not a 21st century lens, but we have to go back and look at it from the biblical lens of the life and times of those that the Bible is talking about. And you do such an outstanding job. Of all the things, and we only have about four minutes left, of all the things you saw, what was the most stunning to you? What jumped out at you that caused you to breathe or even to not be able to breathe? when you stood in the presence of a particular object or a statuary or evidence that you saw that convinced you beyond a shadow of a doubt, I am right in that place? Well, first of all, let me say it's the cumulative evidence of everything all put together. But in terms of one single location, um, me personally is this thing called, that we believe is the split rock. Um, by the way, the locals refer to this giant rock as the split rock of Moses, of Musa. They call it that. So this is not just something that some crazy, dumb American evangelicals are saying, hey, the split rock, this is widely believed by the locals to be the rock that Moses split. This was discovered by Jim and Penny Caldwell. Um, they're the first ones to have found it. But again, the locals had always believed this was the rock. This thing is about uh, 50 to 60 feet tall. You're talking five or six stories tall. It's split down the middle. Now, when you look at the biblical story, the Lord says, Moses, go strike the rock at Horeb. Um, there's millions upon millions of rocks throughout this whole area. If you want to be a rock that stands out, 
to be known as the rock of Horeb, you really got to stand out. And this is a rock that stands out. Five stories tall on top of a hill that's probably about 100 feet tall, which is just a giant pile of rocks. And then at the end of Isaiah 48, the Lord said, in the wilderness, oh Lord, you clave the rock, you baka, you split that rock. And so sure enough, this five, six story tall rock is split right down the middle. And then the waters poured out from above. And you can see what appeared to be uh, a place where water burst forth out of that rock. It's, it's it, every, all of the earmarks are there, all of the criteria, the biblical criteria are there. This is not just like when you go to Israel, you say, well, this is a place where Jesus walked. This is a place where Paul did miracles. It is the miracle. Here is the miracle sitting there like a, like a, like a living testimony on a pedestal for the whole world to see, preserved for 3,500 years. And then Paul the Apostle tells us that it represents Messiah, who was broken, who was split for us. And it's sitting there as this living testimony. And it's just, it's amazing that it's still sitting there undisturbed to this day. And I, I really, you know, of course, it needs to be preserved and protected. We went up and actually walked right through the middle. Um, as the Saudis open this up, there needs to be probably a fence around the hill so that everybody can't just go walking through it. But it's absolutely, it's awe-inspiring. It, it, it's still to this day. In fact, I just had some coins minted where I put a picture of the split rock on the coin. And, um, and I'm actually giving these away with, uh, as a sort of a bundle with my new book on my website. And so that's how much it impacted me. I mean, it's, it's, it's an awe-inspiring rock, but yet it testifies concerning the truth of God. Well, we're going to have the opportunity to visit with you again on Friday, February the 22nd, and continue this dialogue about this. But for our audience today, I want to encourage you to visit either our website, ignitingnation.com, click on the calendar. For today, you'll see Joel Richardson's name. It'll take you to a link. Or go to joelstrumpet.com and see some of the video clips that he has and some of the blogs that he has, and also order a copy of Mount Sinai in Arabia, the latest book to be released by New York Times best-selling author Joel Richardson and a good friend of this program and someone I have a tremendous amount of respect for. Joel, God bless you on your trip. You're getting ready to leave the country again, and uh, we wish you safe travels, and we look forward to seeing you back here in February. All right. Thank you so much, Eric. Always a pleasure to visit with you. You're welcome. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we'll bring you the next edition of Revealing the Truth.